Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve. Today, we'll celebrate the risen Lord this Easter season and be reminded that the resurrection of Christ will transform your faith, your life, and your eternity. How do we know? Because Easter changes everything. If you have your Bible, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we want to talk today a message I've entitled, Easter Changes Everything. I heard a story some years ago about a, a man. He turned 50, and for his birthday, his wife got him a week membership at a health club with a fitness instructor. And he thought that was kind of an interesting gift because he said, you know, I thought I was in pretty good shape. I was still in good shape from my high school time on the chess team. But he said his wife got him this gift. And uh, so he said he called. He said, I called and made a reservation with someone named Tanya. She told me she was a 26-year-old aerobics instructor and athletic clothing model. He said, my wife seemed very pleased with how enthusiastic I was to get started she suggested I keep an exercise diary to chart my progress. So this is what he wrote. Day one, started the morning at 6.30. Tough to get up, but worth it when I arrived at the health club and Tanya was waiting for me. She's something of a goddess with blonde hair and dazzling white smile. She showed me the machines and took my pulse after five minutes on the treadmill. She seemed a little alarmed that it was so high, but I think just standing next to her in that outfit of hers added about 10 points. Tanya was very encouraging as I did my sit-ups, though my gut was already aching a little from holding it in the whole time I was talking to her. This is going to be great. Day two. Took a whole pot of coffee to get me out of the door, but I made it. Tanya had me lie on my back and push this heavy iron bar up into the air. Then she put weights on it for heaven's sakes. Legs were a little wobbly on the treadmill, but I made it the full mile. Her smile made it all worth it. Muscles all feel great. Day three, the only way I can brush my teeth is by laying the toothbrush on the counter and moving my mouth back and forth <laughs> over it. I am certain that I've developed a hernia in both pectorals. <laughs> Driving was okay as long as I didn't try to steer. I parked on top of a Volkswagen. Tanya was a little impatient with me and said my screaming was bothering the other club members. She told me regular exercise would make me live longer. I can't imagine anything worse. Day four, Tanya was waiting for me with her vampire teeth and full snarl. <laughs> can't help it if I was a half an hour late. It took me that long just to tie my shoes. She wanted me to lift dumbbells. Not a chance, Tanya. The word dumb must be in there for a reason. She said I hid in the men's room. He said I hid in the men's room until she sent Lars looking for me. As punishment, she made me try the rowing machine. It sank. Day five, I hate Tanya. <laughs> I hate her more than any human being has ever hated another human being in the history of the world. If there were any part of my body not in extreme pain, I would hit her with it. She thought it would be a good idea to work on my triceps. Well, I got news for you, Tanya. I don't have triceps. And if you don't want dents in the floor, don't hand me any more dumbbells. I refuse to accept responsibility for the damage. You went to say to school. You are to blame for my agony. Day six. Tanya's message on my answering machine, she was wondering where I am. I lacked the strength to use the TV remote, so I watched 11 straight hours of the Weather Channel. <laughs> Day seven. Well, that's the week. Praise God it's over. Maybe next year my wife will give me something a little more fun for my birthday, like a gift certificate for a free root canal. <laughs> what was that guy's problem? He lacked power. He didn't have the power for the workout. You know, Easter 
is all about the power of God. God displayed his power at Easter. Jesus said to those Jews who didn't believe in him, destroy this temple, speaking of the temple of his body, and in three days, I will raise it up again. Romans chapter one, verse four, says that the Lord Jesus was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is all about his power, his power to do what he said he was going to do, and it gives power to the cross. See, the cross by itself doesn't have power to forgive sin. It's the cross with the resurrection that gives it power, power to change your life and mine. You know, lots of people come to church at Easter. And that's great. And, and if you're here and you, you haven't been here before, or maybe you hadn't been here a long time, we're so glad that you're here. But many people come to church at Easter, and you know what? The honest truth is this. They don't have much power. They don't really have power in their lives to overcome sins and overcome addictions and overcome their anger problems and overcome their jealousy problems and their bitterness problems and, and all sorts of difficulties in their life. It's just like, I don't have the strength to do this. Where is the power that the Bible talks about? You know, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. We want to talk about the power of his resurrection because it's the power to transform your life, to transform my life. Easter changes everything when you understand what Easter really means. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul has a long discussion with the Corinthians about the subject of the resurrection. 58 verses devoted to the resurrection because the resurrection is so critical. The resurrection is the glue that holds the gospel to together. The resurrection is the guts of the gospel. If you take the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ out of the story of Christianity, it collapses like a house of cards. We have no Christianity without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in Corinth, you had false teachers that came in after Paul established the church, and they began to teach the people, and they said, well, you know, there's no such thing as a resurrection. I mean, don't believe in a resurrection. The, the uh, philosophers in Athens, Greece, which is 65 miles from Corinth, Greece, the philosophers in, in Athens, uh, they said there's no way that there is a resurrection of the physical body. They didn't believe that at all because they said that the body is evil. The body's like a prison for the spirit. And so when you die, what happens? Your spirit is set free from your body. So the idea that there would be a bodily resurrection, it would be like, well, who would want that? You don't want to be uh, the, the prison to be resurrected. So they rejected it completely. So did the Sadducees who lived in Jerusalem. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. But Paul makes the case that, hey, if there is no resurrection, there is no Christianity. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead... How do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead and then follow his logic? If there is no resurrection of the dead, well, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. I mean, we, we told you Jesus rose from the dead, but our preaching is just a lie. He says in verse 15, moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still, still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we had hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But, verse 20, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. If Christ had never been raised, Christianity collapses. But Paul says in verse 20 emphatically, Christ has been raised. It is a fact of history that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You say, how is that a fact of history? Because he says in the first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus, when he rose from the dead, appeared to Peter 
And then he appeared to his group called the 12, his disciples. And then he appeared to James, James, the half brother of Jesus. And then he appeared to 500 brethren at one time probably referring to Matthew chapter 28 when Jesus gave the Great Commission on the unnamed mountain in Galilee. 500 people saw him. Now you think about this. Any lawyer who goes to court and he has 500 eyewitnesses that all say the same thing. Yes, I saw this, I saw that. All testify to the same thing. That case is a slam dunk. No one can argue with that case. Why? He's got 500 eyewitnesses. There are 500 eyewitnesses who testified, and many of them testified by their death and with their own blood that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It's a fact of history that there is an empty tomb in Jerusalem where Jesus Christ stretched and yawned on the third day and rose in mighty power. So Paul's whole case is, well, what if this didn't happen? If this didn't happen, everything falls apart. So there's power. Tremendous power in the resurrection. And we want to tap into that power. The question is, have you personally experienced the transforming power of Easter? Because Easter changes everything. I want to share with you three truths this morning from this passage of Scripture. Truth number one, the resurrection of Jesus Christ can transform your faith. Can transform your faith. What you believe in, it can transform that. Look in verse 16 again. It says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. Your faith is useless. It's futile. It's pointless. It's empty. What's the point of having faith if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead? You mark it down, faith in a dead man is totally worthless. Uh, How can a dead man help you? Jesus, we call him the savior of the world. Well, how can you save anyone if you're dead? Many of us have had the experience of going to a pool in the summertime. When I was a kid growing up uh, in Lakewood Forest in Houston, my family was a member of the subdivision pool. And so I would go there in the summer. And we had two lifeguards that worked there in the summer. There are two lifeguard stations. It was a big pool. And uh, they hired guys to sit there in the lifeguard stand. Some of you might uh, do that in the summer, uh, being a lifeguard. Being a lifeguard's cool, especially when you're a seventh grader and you look up to the lifeguard who's in high school and he uh, just seems stronger than you and tanner than you and just cooler than you. And it's like, man, that guy, a lifeguard, that's a pretty cool job. So he's got this white stuff all over his nose. You know, he's one of those guys, nose coat, because he's always in the sun. But you, you look at that and say, that, that's an important job. You had to get out of the pool when the lifeguard went and to get a sandwich. He, okay, his pool shut down, lifeguard's gone. Then he'd come back. Okay, you can back, get, get back in the pool. Can you imagine if you were the guy running the pool and said, I don't want to pay this lifeguard, this nose coat guy. I don't want to pay him. Somebody run down to Dillard's and get a mannequin. We're going to put the mannequin in the lifeguard stand. We're going to get, he's going to be tan. He's going to look good. He's going to have muscles. He's made of plastic. And so we're going to put him in there. Well, you can do that unless you have somebody. It's going great until somebody dies, somebody drowns. And uh, what? hey, look to the mannequin lifeguard. He can't help. Why? Because he's not alive. That's why. And, and if we say that we believe in Jesus as some liberal theologian, say, well, we believe in Jesus, but we don't believe that Jesus actually rose bodily from the dead. We believe he rose spiritually from the dead. Well, that's not what the Bible says. And a spiritual resurrection of Jesus from the dead, it's like having a mannequin in the lifeguard stand. It, it doesn't change anything. Listen, faith in a dead Savior is worthless. It's worthless teacher gave an assignment to her high school students, English teacher, to write a paper on the greatest living man. One of the students wrote a paper on Jesus Christ. He turned in his paper. His teacher saw the subject matter, and she said, no, you, you misunderstood the, the assignment. I said, the greatest living man. He said, you misunderstood. Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. He is the greatest living man. Faith in a dead man, totally worthless. Now, I would think that most of the people here today, most watching live stream and most under the sound of my voice, you say, well, I I believe, Jeff, that Jesus did rise again, bodily rise again from the dead. 
But you know what the majority of people in this world have? They don't have necessarily faith in a dead man. They have faith. These are people who call themselves Christians. They have faith in themselves. Faith in themselves. Now, faith in a dead man is worthless faith. Faith in yourself is worthless faith. You say, what is faith in yourself? Well, it goes like this. It says, well, I believe that Jesus died on the cross, and I believe that he rose again from the dead, and I believe that the formula for salvation is Jesus plus what I do equals salvation. Jesus plus my good works. Jesus plus my righteousness. Jesus plus my church attendance. Jesus plus what I do. That's what equals salvation. And that's why there's a big question mark in many people's minds whether they're going to go to heaven or not. Did you know every single religion, you can spell every single religion the same. It's spelled D-O, do, what must I do, what must I do? Christianity is not spelled D-O, it's spelled D-O-N-E, done. It is done, it is finished. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin is left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. It's not Jesus plus your good works, it's Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. But people trust in themselves, they put faith in themselves. I've asked this question to many people over the years from evangelism explosion, they came up with a question. The question says this, suppose you were to die tonight and stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? I've had people say, well, they're like, well, I, you know, I, don't, I didn't know he was going to ask me that, but let me see. I, well, I, I got baptized. Um, I'm a church member. Um, I'm a good person. I had one guy tell me, he said, well, I have six kids. Oh, that's a, that's a different one. Uh, okay, six kids, that's good. Uh, one lady told me, I'm, I'm not making this up, I asked her that question. She said, what would I say to God? Why should he let me into heaven? Because I deserve it. I thought, wow, how, how ignorant could you possibly be? You deserve it. That woman doesn't understand how holy God is and how sinful she is. Listen, no one deserves it. No one deserves it. And no one can add to what Jesus did on the cross, somehow add in your, your works to make it um, more worthy as an offering to the Father. The Scripture says in Psalm 49, we can never redeem ourselves. We cannot pay God the price for our lives because the payment for a human life is too great. What could we pay, what we could pay would never be enough to keep us from the grave to let us live forever. You can't save yourself. Quit putting your faith in yourself. Faith in yourself will fail every single time because you are a sinner. I'm a sinner. You know, people say, well, I'm a good person, Jeff. You don't understand I'm a good person. All right. I'm glad you're a good person. Here's God's standard. If you want to try on your own to get to heaven, you have to be perfect. You have to be perfect. Anybody perfect in here? You perfect in here? I have so just kind of fly around for a little while. Let us see how perfect you are. There's none righteous, not even one. The Pharisees were those, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They viewed others with contempt. When Ross sang his song, we talked about the Pharisees. Jesus came for the out-and-out -out sinner. He came for the upright sinner. But we're all sinners, sinners by birth, sinners by nature, sinners by choice, sinners by practice. We're sinners four times over. And the only way that you can uh, enter into a relationship with God is recognizing that I'm a sinner. You know, the Lord asked me, Jeff, why should I let you into heaven? What would be my answer? It would be, Jesus, you shouldn't let me into heaven because Jeff Shreve is a sinner, but Jeff Shreve the sinner put his faith and trust in you and you alone in January of 1980, and in my hands no price I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling. And Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he'll say, welcome in. Welcome in, because that's how he saves, by his grace. You trust nothing of yourself. You trust completely in him. Hey, the resurrection of Jesus Christ can transform your faith. You quit trusting in yourself, and you trust in him and him alone. Second truth, the resurrection of Jesus Christ can transform your life. 
Not only your faith, because you put your faith in him, the risen Savior, and him alone, but it transforms your life. See, he says in verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. In your sins. That's a bad thing to still be in your sins. You're still dogged by your sins. You're still chained to your sins. You're still condemned by your sins. You're still haunted by your sins. If Jesus Christ didn't come out of the grave. I like what the 19th century philosopher Thomas Carlyle wrote. He talked about a man, wrote a story about a man who was trying to escape his shadow. You know, we sing that song, Just Me and My Shadow. And this man said, I'm going to escape my shadow. And so he tried and tried and tried. And no matter how hard he tried, no matter how fast he ran, no matter how carefully he hid, his shadow was right there. He couldn't escape his shadow. Hey, his shadow is a picture of sin. No matter how hard you try, no matter how fast you run, no matter how good you try and be, you can't escape the shadow of sin, the sin or the, the shame and the guilt and the condemnation of your sin. But because Jesus died on the cross and rose again on the third day, you and I can be set free from sin. See, so you can be forgiven and set free. The moment that you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're forgiven and you're set free. The scripture says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, speaking of Jesus, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. To forgive means that you release from a debt. And all of us in this room, all of us uh, watching, today, listening today, we're in debt to God. We have a sin debt that's so huge, that's so massive. If you lived to a thousand lifetimes, you couldn't pay it. You couldn't pay it back. That's why hell is an eternal place, because in all eternity, you can't pay it back. We have sinned against God, but God put all that sin on his son. That's when Jesus was on the cross. He had, before he went to the cross, he had the cup and he said, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What was in the cup? The cup was all your sin, all my sin, all the sin of all the world that he drank. He took into himself and he died in your place and in mine. He paid a debt he didn't owe. He paid a debt you couldn't pay and I couldn't pay. Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. He released us from our sins by his blood. And you know what? The moment that a person recognizes, I'm a sinner, I'm in trouble. I've had faith in self, but now I realize faith in self isn't gonna cut it because it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So I'm in trouble, but I'm gonna put my faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. And the moment that you do that, the scripture says he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Can you imagine how wonderful it would be to go home today knowing beyond any shadow of any doubt that you've been forgiven of every single sin, all those things in your past, all those things that you did just this morning, forgiven. All the things in the future, forgiven. See, when the Lord forgives your sins, he forgives past, present, and future. Some people have trouble with that. They say, well, you know, I know God forgave me for what I did, you know, five years ago, but man, I'm struggling because now I've been a Christian five years and I've sinned and, and I think I've really messed up. Listen, when Jesus died on the cross, all your sins were future. You weren't born yet, most of you. And he, and he, he he died 2,000 years ago, roughly. All your sins were future. He said, it is finished. It's paid in full. I love the story of the woman, Iris Blue. Iris Blue was, uh, grew up rough, rough life growing up. She went to the streets early in Houston. She was a prostitute. She was a drug addict. 
She's just a thief. She was a terrible life. She ended up doing hard time for seven years in the pen. When she got out, she went right back into uh, the bar scene, the drug scene, the prostitution scene. She had a man that began to witness to her, told her that the Lord loved her, told her that the Lord could change her. And then one day he told her, he said, you know, Iris, I don't think I'm going to be able to talk to you anymore because the Lord has convicted me and told me not to talk to tramps. And she said when he called her a tramp, it just cut her to the quick. And she was about ready to let him have it. But then he interjected very quickly. He said, but you know what, Iris? You don't have to be a tramp anymore. You can be a lady if you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus. And Iris said there was just something about what he said that just resonated in her heart. She said, all my life, I wanted to be a lady. I wanted to be a lady. And he said, we can pray right now, and you can ask Christ to come into your life. And she said, I want to do that. And she said they were outside of a bar in Houston. And in her own words, she said, I knelt down, a loser, a zero, a tramp, and I gave my life to Jesus. And I asked him to save me, and I asked him to forgive me, and I asked him to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And she said, I arose a lady. I was totally changed from the inside out. And she's been an evangelist ever since, sharing what great things the Lord has done for her. Hey, you can be forgiven and set free. And not only that, you can experience Jesus Christ living in you and living through you. That's the thing where uh, so many Christians, that's where they fall apart. You know, they're, they're tracking good, and maybe you're here and you say, Jeff, I, I did what Iris Blue did. It wasn't as dramatic as Iris, but I asked Christ to forgive me, and I believe that he did forgive me, and I don't walk in condemnation and guilt and shame because I believe that the Lord has forgiven me and has transferred me into the kingdom of his beloved son. I believe that I have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. But here's where so many Christians fall apart. They think the Christian life is just gritting your teeth, just putting the nose to the grindstone and trying harder and harder and harder to do this. So, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just not going to cuss today. I'm not, I'm not going to lust today. I'm not going to lose my temper today. And I'm just going to try harder and harder. The Christian life is not about trying harder. The Christian life is about understanding, I can't do it. I can't live the Christian life. You can't live the Christian life. The Apostle Paul can't live the Christian life. There's only one who can live the Christian life, and that is Jesus Christ. He lives the Christian life, and he says, listen, as you realize you can't do it, then you'll come to me and say, Lord, I can't do this. And he said, that's right, you can't do it. But I can do it through you. So if you'll just get out of the way and let me sit on the throne of your life, let me control you, and you just be my servant, I will lead you and guide you, and I will fill your heart with love and joy and peace and power. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Paul said, hey, on the road to Damascus, when I put my faith and trust in Jesus, the old Saul of Tarsus died. But I got a brand new life in Jesus Christ. I'm a brand new person. I'm not Saul of Tarsus. I'm Paul the apostle, and I'm a brand new person. I still look the same, but I'm different from the inside out. Hey, in January of 1980, the old Jeff Shreve Somebody you wouldn't have liked because he was arrogant and he was a jerk. He's handsome, but he was just a jerk and uh, just stuffed full of himself, just trying to, to, trusting in self, thinking I could earn heaven. And then he came to the realization, I'm a sinner and I'm lost. Jesus, save me. And he did. And that night, Jeff Shreve died to his old way of life. And Jeff Shreve got a brand new life in Jesus Christ. Jesus, by his spirit, came to live inside of me. And the Christian life is saying, Jesus, you who live in me, live through me, lead my life. And that changes everything because that's what brings love and joy and peace and power. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ can transform your faith. It can transform your life. And lastly, it can transform your eternity. Look what he says in verse 18. If Christ has not been raised, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. 
Apollume is the Greek word for perished. Perished is an important word in the Bible. We read John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. To perish, that word literally means to be utterly destroyed. It's not just death. It's death in hell. It's death and separation from God forever. And the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that God is not wishing, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who's, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God didn't send Jesus into this world to send you to hell. He sent Jesus into this world to save you from hell. But listen, something that you need to understand, when you're born into this world, you're born on the broad road that leads to destruction. You're, you're born on an avenue called Perishing Avenue, and we're all walking this road, and we're perishing, and that goes off a cliff that leads to hell forever and ever and ever. And Jesus stands on the broad road, and he says, repent. He doesn't want us to perish. And if any man, any woman, any boy or any girl ends up in hell, they have to trip over the cross of Jesus Christ to get there because he's there saying, don't go this way. I came that you wouldn't have to experience death. I took your sin. I took your shame. I took your death. And I died for you on the cross. And if you'll just put your faith and trust in me, if you'll repent of your sin, that means to change your mind Change your mind concerning sin, concerning self, concerning the Savior, and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're saved by repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. If you will do that, he'll save you. And he'll put you, take you off the broad road and put you on the narrow road that leads to life. He doesn't want you to perish. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ can transform your eternity. Listen, I know this isn't politically correct, but if you've been around me any time at all, you know that I don't care about political correctness any at all. But here's the truth. Without Jesus Christ, your eternity is hell forever. That's your eternity. That's the eternity for every person outside of Jesus Christ. Every person who's on the broad road and hears about the cross and just says, oh, that's nice for somebody else and keeps on going for those who sneer at the resurrection as they did in Acts chapter 17 when Paul preached in Athens, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't need that. I don't need, you know, religion's for somebody else. It's not for me. Hey, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There is no one else. Let me tell you something. Buddha is not God. Confucius is not God. Mohammed is not God. Jesus Christ is God and God alone. And you're not going to get to heaven any other way than through him. Without Jesus, your eternity is hell forever. You say, oh, but, but Jeff, don't get all worked up because, see, I, I believe in Jesus and I believe in the resurrection. You know who else believes in Jesus and believes in the resurrection? The devil. The devil. It's all in here. All in his head. He believes. He knows about the cross. He knows about the resurrection. He knows there's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. When the demons would, uh, a demon-possessed man would come in contact with Jesus during his ministry, they'd cry out and they'd say, I know who you are. The Holy One of God, they know. Let me tell you what they don't do. They don't repent. They don't trust Him. They don't turn from their sin, from their self. And they don't turn to the Savior. They keep going on, but they know it's all in their head. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, concerning the eternity of those who die without Him, He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, for many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out miracles? And in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He doesn't say, I knew you and forgot you. He says, I never knew you. And these aren't people who are Sunday morning bench warmers. These are people who preached in his name, who cast out demons in his name, who performed miracles in his name. These are people like Judas Iscariot who did all that stuff. But Jesus said, I never knew you. You were never mine. You never repented 
and put your faith and trust in me. How scary to die without Jesus. To, to just say, well, I'm, I guess I'm okay because I have him in my head. That's not going to cut it. Listen, here's the good news. None of us have to be without Jesus because he came to save and he wants everyone to come to him. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest so we can come to him and we can put our faith and trust in him. And without Jesus, your eternity is hell forever. But with Jesus, your eternity is heaven forever. And you can have such tremendous confidence. Jesus said to his disciples on the night before he went to the cross, he said, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We have the promise from Jesus that if we put our faith and trust in him, we repent of sin and put our faith and trust in him, that we can know that we know that we know that we know that he's coming to get us. He's been preparing a place for us, and he wants us to be with him one day. Man, I can't wait for that day. What is heaven like? The great preacher of yesteryear, uh, R.G. Lee, said this. He had a little girl ask him one day at the tomb of, his, of her mother, just a six-year-old girl. She said, Dr. Lee, what is heaven like? And he said, my daughter, my child. He said, heaven is all that the wisdom of God could comprehend and all that the power of God could create. Heaven is such an awesome, wonderful place. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, what eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has even entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love him? Have you put your faith and trust in him? Have you turned from sin and turned to the Savior? I heard a story about Albert Einstein, the great German physicist. Albert Einstein was known as probably one of the smartest guys who has ever lived, but he was also kind of an absent-minded guy, the absent-minded professor type of guy. He was on a train, the story goes, uh, from Princeton, New Jersey, and he was there in the train, and the train conductor came by, and he was stamping tickets. And so he came to Dr. Einstein, and, and he said, I need your ticket. And Einstein checked his pocket, and it wasn't in that pocket. It wasn't in that pocket. It wasn't in, in his pants pocket. He looked in his briefcase. It wasn't in his briefcase. He's like, ah. And uh, the conductor said, uh, Dr. Einstein, that's okay. I know who you are. That, that's fine. You don't need to worry about your ticket. I know you bought a ticket. And so he, the conductor kept on going. He's about ready to leave the car, go to the next car. And he looked back there, and Einstein's on his hands and knees uh, looking under the seat for his ticket. He comes back. He said, Dr. Einstein, I told you. I know who you are. It's okay. And Einstein gets up, and he said, son, I know who I am too. What I don't know is where I'm going. Some of you, if you're honest, you don't know where you're going. You're playing Russian roulette with eternity. Today is the day to nail down your salvation, to surrender your heart and life to Jesus Christ, to get down on your knees like Iris Blue did, a tramp, a loser, a sinner, and receive the Savior and arise a lady. Easter really does change everything, but here's the question, has it changed you? Have you taken the truth of the cross and the empty tomb and applied it to your own life? If not, you can do that today. You can put your faith and trust in Jesus and be forgiven and set free. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart, come into my life. Change me, make me the person you want me to be. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. 
please take the time to call that toll-free number. Write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.